Well, we have come to the 64th installment of the 66 book series at GBC. So we are two weeks away from wrapping it up and a joy to be able to see and hear all the men that have been able to labor in a particular text, uh, which is very difficult to do, taking a whole book and reducing it into a single sermon. Thankfully tonight, we only have a small sheet of paper it was written on parchment. And so we'll actually get to do not only background, but exposition, which is a blast. So if you've got your Bible, which I hope you do, go ahead and open it up to 3 John. If you didn't get a chance to listen to 1 John uh, that was uh, taught by Matt Kelso, 2 John that was taught by Scott Demarest, I would encourage you, go back and listen to those. They were excellent. And what's been really sweet about this, you know, I was talking with somebody recently. They said, you know, we could have just taught 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in one installment. It's like, yeah, we could have. But thinking about it more, it actually gives everybody more exposure to 1st John, 2nd, 3rd. You get to hear the background for each one all over again. And so it means when you come to these books in the future, guess what? You've got even more clarity of what was happening. And so it gives us the opportunity to do that this morning. And so what I want us to do first is I want us to do this. I want you to imagine living during the time when the early church was being founded. There's joys, there's difficulties, there's hardship, there's small churches meeting in homes throughout the whole Roman Empire. The canon of scripture is still in the process of being established. And so you don't have the New Testament in your hands, you have the Old Testament And you're relying on the teaching of the apostles. There are false teachers claiming to be sent by the apostles. It's a time of great joy, but with it, there's also tremendous difficulty, suspicion. Can I trust this individual, the message that they're teaching? Can I confirm it with the apostles? I want you to picture now being somewhere where you're looking at a home that's located in Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. It's late. The lamps are lit. The home is busy with life. People are eating. It's an evening meal. And while you're eating, there's a knock at the door. Standing in front of the man who is the head of the household is a small group of travelers. One of them, he introduces himself as Demetrius, and he hands the man a letter. Breaking the string that bound the letter and tearing its seal very carefully, he unfolds the letter, looks down at a single sheet of parchment, and he begins reading. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brothers came and bore witness to your truth. That is how you are walking in the truth. And I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever work you do for the brothers and are doing this though they are strangers. And they bore witness to your love before the church you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, receiving nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not welcome what we say. For this reason, if I come... I will bring to remembrance his deeds, which he does, unjustly disparaging us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not welcome the brothers either. Then he forbids those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good witness from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our witness, and you know that our witness is true. I have many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. 
greet the friends by name. We get a glimpse into a private letter written from the Apostle John to this man, Gaius. Sweet to think about a man entertaining guests that are coming to his home. And even though the exact details on how this letter came to him are unknown, it is sweet to think about what it might have looked like. Gaius is an individual receiving this letter. And something I want us to look at first is I want us to look at background. I know this has been touched by Matt, it's been touched by Scott. But when you think about your Bible and you're reading it, you work through where does 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John fit in? Okay, we think about the gospel accounts. It's the life of Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the book of Acts. This is the church being founded from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. And if you read Paul's letters, he writes them in such a way where you can insert his letters into the chronology for the book of Acts, right? I'm reading Philippians, I know right where this fits. I'm in 1 Thessalonians, I know right where this fits in. But you read 1 and 2 and 3 John, and you're like, I just don't know where this fits. And so I want to spend a little bit of time just looking at that. That way, when we're reading, we're aware of what's happening historically, and where do these books sit? I want us to do this because when we're reading our Bibles as students of God's Word, it gives us the ability to just have a little more clarity. And so let's do that first. And this is written by the Apostle John, even though he introduces himself here just as the elder. Uh, more than likely written from Ephesus in Asia Minor. Now, the letter was probably written in between 80 and 90 AD. This is a quote from a guy named Jeffers, who's done a tremendous amount of work on historical and cultural background. He says this, The church father, Arrhenius, who lived from 130 to 202 AD, and the church historian, Eusebius, from 260 to 339 AD, they claim that the Apostle John spent his last five years in Ephesus. And during this time, he wrote the five books of the New Testament ascribed to him. The churches singled out for comment in John's book of Revelation are within easy communication range from Ephesus. Here's another one from a guy named Daniel Aiken. It says, it points out that whatever date one affirms for 3 John, it must allow adequate time for the growth of the false teaching reflected in 1 John. This perhaps is why many scholars believe the date of the, first, or the late first century is the wisest judgment concerning the date of writing. And so Asia is modern-day Turkey for us. Now, as we think about the gospel making its way into Asia, John is obviously writing here to a church or churches or a group of churches that are in Asia, but when did that actually start? So you don't need to turn here. You can go back to it later. I'll reference all these sections in Scripture. Acts 16.6. This is Paul on his second missionary journey. He has Silas with him, and he also has Timothy. The Holy Spirit actually forbids them from proclaiming the gospel in Asia. And that's during their second journey. So all God allows him to do is make his way through the upper region of Asia. He has a brief stop in a small coastal town called Troas, and then he goes on to Macedonia. In Acts 18, 18 through 23, returning from his second missionary journey, he stops in Ephesus. He leaves Priscilla and Aquila there, and then he briefly goes into a synagogue, and he interacts with some Jews there. But there's no massive gospel proclamation that occurs. Now, as Paul goes on, he's making his way to Caesarea, then on to Antioch. Apollos comes, and he stops in Ephesus. And Priscilla and Aquila actually give him guidance on clarifying that Christ is the fulfillment of the one to come that John had been proclaiming all of this time. So while Paul is away, Apollos is in Ephesus, and he's preaching and he's teaching. Now, when Paul comes back, Apollos leaves and he goes on to Corinth. And so when you come to Acts 19, that is when the foundation for the church in Asia begins. In fact, you have a whole chapter dedicated to Paul and all of his efforts of preaching and teaching in Ephesus. So that is his third missionary journey. So the gospel witness and disciples in Ephesus... That is when it is founded, which is wild. And there is a supernatural spread that occurs at this time. Acts 19.10 says this. It says this, all the teaching, the preaching, and things in Ephesus. It says it took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. 
It's not limited to one particular group. It was everybody ethnically within that group. They all were able to hear the message of the gospel. And so the spread was massive. That was around AD 52 to 50, uh, AD 52 to 55. Then there's an uprising that occurs from a silversmith who is losing all of his money because the gospel was becoming so prominent in Ephesus. And as a result of that riot, Paul actually leaves. And if you look at 1 Timothy 1, 2 through 3, Paul leaves Timothy in Ephesus. And he tells him, stay, and you're going to preach and teach, and you're going to care for the disciples that are here. False teaching was prevalent, and so he leaves him. Acts chapter 20, verses 18 to 38, Paul is on his return from his third missionary journey. He is making his way back to Jerusalem, and he meets with the elders from the church in Ephesus. Uh, this is something that John, not John, this is something that uh, Matt Kelso alluded to when he was making his way through 1 John. But he charges them and speaks to them about the concern he has about wolves rising up that are going to devour the sheep. And so even then, there's concern over the churches in Asia, Ephesus primarily. But this is what's so interesting. From AD 52 to 55, where you have this prominence of gospel witness within Ephesus, it's only growing, it declines over a period of time. And maybe I would say it this way, there is a diminishing apostolic influence of the gospel that happens in that area. And listen to this, this is at the close of Paul's life. This is 2 Timothy 1.15. Paul is in prison. This is probably somewhere around 64 AD. Nero has burnt Rome, blamed it on Christians, and as a result, you have Paul now imprisoned. He's writing his last letter off to Timothy. This is what he says, verse 15. You, Timothy, are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me. All turned away from me. I mean, Paul is the one who founded the church in Ephesus. He lists these men, among whom are Phagellius and Hermogenes. And so there's a shift that occurred in some capacity. Why do you have a decline that's happening in Asia? Apostolic influence is reducing. But then if we think about Revelation, which we've been making our way through, you have all of these churches that are named in the beginning of Revelation, the letters are supposed to be written to, that Christ gives to John. And so there's a change that occurs. John probably wrote Revelation sometime around 95 AD. So you have a 30-year period where John is writing in 95 AD, go back, Paul is put to death around 65. So what's happening in that 30-year period? And that's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That is that period of time. Here's what's interesting to think through. The question is, why in the world did it go from declining apostolic influence and then all of a sudden there's influence? In AD 66, that is when the Jewish war against Rome began. And it culminated in AD 70 when the temple was completely destroyed. And so when there's a war, unfortunately people die and there's lots of people to flee. And so where did all those individuals go? The apostles are in Jerusalem. You have individuals like Philip the Evangelist. They flee, they leave. The individuals move to surrounding regions and guess where a lot of them went? Asia. And so that 30 year period is a period where John takes up his apostolic post in Ephesus and he is carrying out an endeavor of church strengthening and church advancement and gospel advancement that is happening within the region of Asia, primarily out of Ephesus. The fact that people would have moved is this evident. This is interesting. Philip the evangelist and his daughters, for example, right? Their tomb, or at least Philip's tomb, is actually discovered in Hierapolis, which is just north of Laodicea. So the remaining apostles, who knows how many there were, we know John lived the longest, would have taken up their role there. So this is the era that Gaius lived in. This is where he is, standing at his door with the letter in his hand, and right outside are these traveling brothers just waiting to come in. They're strangers, but they say they're sent by John the elder. Who can be trusted? Who do you trust during this period of time? Second John, which Scott was getting to last week, there's actually a prohibition against hospitality. 
for individuals that don't bring this truth. What was that? If anybody comes and says, Christ did not come in the flesh, do not give them a formal greeting. Don't invite them into your home because you are identified with their false teaching. Who do you trust? You have traveling preachers that are going all around in this region. What is Gaius supposed to do? This letter is a letter of commendation in one sense. And then in another sense, this letter is actually a letter that is commanding him to be a man that is continuing in his labors of caring for individuals that are traveling as preachers, teachers, and missionaries sent by the Apostle John himself. So if we're going to summarize this really in its totality, uh, this would be the title uh, for tonight. John's focus of gospel expansion support is displayed in four sections. So within our little letter that's very small, the smallest book in the Bible, it, it, I don't even call it a book, just call it a letter. That's really what it is. It's a page. He gives us four sections. But what is his primary thrust? What is his focus? His focus is gospel expansion support in this letter. John has a massive endeavor that he is moving forward. And there are individuals that are regularly being sent to different churches. And there's a need for these individuals to be validated as those who have a testimony that is sure, that is right, that is good. Can I trust this individual? But the focus here is on the support of those individuals. And so what he does is he starts out, verses 1 through 8, with an amazing commendation. It's an amazing commendation. It starts first, obviously, with the greeting from this man, the elder, which we have talked about being John. Now, the word elder can just mean an individual that's older. Uh, it can also mean an individual who's in a particular office, uh, an individual who's an officer within the church. If you're thinking about a person that is an elder pastor. John is actually older at this point. And then he also writes Third John with a really authoritative tone. And so I think it kind of has both. And maybe they're affectionately calling him the old man in a, in a sweet way. You know, I meet with somebody every single week who's older than me. Every time he sees me, he says, hello, young man. And I don't reply with the other. But this may be the affectionate tone that he has coming across here. Gaius is interesting. You know, when I first was making my way through the Bible, I'd look at Gaius. I'm like, oh, man, Gaius is everywhere in the Bible. He's, he's all over the place. But there's probably multiple Gaiuses. Um, in fact, the name Gaius was one of 18 different, just very common names that were selected by Romans in this era. There's four of them in your Bible, and they are not all the same person. Here's, here's some examples. There's one who is Gaius from Derby in Acts 20, verse 4. There's a Gaius from Macedonia. He's a companion of Paul in Ephesus. That's in Acts 19, 29. There is also Gaius from Corinth, baptized by Paul, 1 Corinthians 1, 14, probably lived with him when he wrote Romans, Romans 16, 23. And here is Gaius, who is addressed in Sir John, a different man. But he is called the beloved. You think about how sweet and affectionate that term is. This is a very special, close relationship. This is the same word that was used by God, the father of his own son. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. The same thing that Paul would say to Timothy. This is, you're, he's my beloved child in ministry. Just an individual, but there is a tight relationship of love, and it is within a particular domain. It's within the realm of truth. You see that in verse 1. John's love is surrounded around the fact that they are arm in arm in gospel ministry. And so Gaius is reading this, thinking about John, who he affectionately loves, and John wrote it thinking about the one that he affectionately loves in return. He immediately moves into praises for him. He tells Gaius that he is regularly patterned by prayer for him. He doesn't say, Gaius, I prayed for you. And then I went on and did something else. And it's, it's the, Gaius, I'm always praying for you. I'm always praying for you. This is a pattern for him. And it gives us this sweet picture. He says to him, he desires that he would prosper in everything, in every respect. And I tend to think about like in every, in every domain. Yeah, in every domain, he wants him to prosper. In fact, the wording in this in Greek is really like it was used to say, I hope that you're led along in a good road. And so life just goes well for you, Gaius. That's what he wants. 
And he prays specifically that Gaius would be in good health. Not good health for the sake of good health. He, he says at the end of two, he wants Gaius' health to match the well-being of his own soul. As Gaius' soul prospers, John prays that his body would follow suit. Now, by contrast, just think about this. Imagine a person who is in excellent shape physically, but bitter, cold, and unloving towards everyone. A person's physical condition is pointless because that person will be physically able to spread that bitterness with even greater speed because of their good health. But imagine a person who delights in what is true, loves the Lord, is joyful, and is a picture of Christian love to others. Imagine that person being in good health. They're able to spread all of that quickly, effectively. In fact, there's never a situation they can't go and be involved and care for and provide for people. So John is praying, I know your soul is prospering because of the report I'm hearing, and I hope your health matches that so that you're able to press on in ministry and do it well. You look at verse 3 to 4 real quick. John, he's moved to write this letter and pray these things for Gaius because some of these traveling teacher missionaries, they returned to John and they reported to him. Look at that. It says, when brothers came and bore witness to your truth. So when brothers came, came from where? I don't know. But who did they come to? They came to John. And John got the report. And this moved John to write this letter and to be praying regularly for Gaius. Notice in verse 3, these brothers didn't just report to John on general things. They reported about Gaius' truth. Not his theological knowledge necessarily, but his practice of the truth. He doesn't come back and say, hey, listen, Gaius knows how to cross his theological T's. I mean, he's just, he's got everything pinned down. Uh, we work through systematic theology. He has it. We quizzed him. We grilled him. It doesn't say any of that. He, he looks at their observation of his life. How do you observe a person's professed love for Christ? I mean, that's a question all of us have to think through. You look at their love for others. You look at their care for others, their sacrificial giving towards others. This is what James gets to in terms of an individual professing to have faith, but there's no actions that validate that profession. He's looking at Gaius and saying, his actions validate it. John calls this walking in the truth. And I don't think there's a better word picture in terms of observing that, especially in terms of Christian living. Do you imagine getting up every morning and asking yourself this, am I ready to walk in the truth? Am I prepared to walk in what I know is true? If we got up in the morning every day, if I got up every morning and I said that to myself, I think I would probably pattern my life in a way that would just be more in line with what I know is true. Because John heard this, he starts bleeding on the page in one sense. Verse 4 says he has no greater joy. None. You know, maybe there's like a local Euro shop down the street that John just hasn't gone to yet. And he's like, no, that's the greatest joy. No, no greater joy. He literally writes down nothing apart from this. This is it. Why is he rejoicing? You know, here, here's a picture. If you're a parent... And you watch your kids, and you see them, and they're close by, they know you're watching, and they're obedient, they're walking in a way that you're pleased with. That's one thing. As a parent, that's really encouraging. But when you get a report from somebody else that your kids are walking in a way that is good, what do you do as a parent? You rejoice. I wasn't around. They weren't pleasing me. They were actually conducting themselves in a way that was appropriate. So John does what? He rejoices over the fact that Gaius is walking in a way that pleases not only him, but it pleases the Lord. Verses 5 to 8, we're still working through the amazing commendation, and we get to see why he is commended so thoroughly. What specifically was Gaius doing for these brothers? It gave him such a warm commendation for John. Verse 5 picks this up. It says, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever work you do for the brothers and are doing this as though they are strangers. 
And so his work, his labors, his efforts deployed towards helping these brothers was the observable mark of Gaius walking in the truth. This is how he knew that he was living his life in a way that was pleasing to the Lord. It was proven all the more clearly because some of these brothers, they were strangers. Now, when you have somebody over your home, just think about it. If you know the person, it's easy. You know what they like to drink. You know what they like to eat. You know what their patterns are in life. It's easy to host somebody that you know. But a stranger, you have no idea what's coming. I don't know what they like to drink. Do you like ice in your water? Do you not like ice in your water? What do you like to eat? Are you vegan? Are you getting gluten allergies? Like, I have no idea how to respond to any of this. And so he's accepting strangers. Walking in the truth is something that is easy just to say, but when it actually comes to real life, a stranger walks through the door, you want to care for them. It just takes more labor and more effort and time. Strangers always require more time more effort, more energy to host. John says here, Gaius, that those efforts, they're faithful efforts. You know what's interesting is, did you notice he doesn't limit it? Look down at five. He says, you are acting faithfully in whatever work you do. But it's isolated to a particular group. It's work for the brothers. That is faithful work. And something even to think through, it's He's doing faithful work for these individuals, but he's doing faithful work to who? Faithful in whose eyes? Sure, in John's eyes, it's faithful, but it's also faithful in terms of God. God is looking at his conduct, and God is deeming it faithful. Gaius, who's probably a leader of a house church in a different city, is known for his pattern of hospitality in support of these traveling teachers or missionaries in Asia. The end of verse 6 is interesting. Look at this. John speaks even in the future here. He says, you will do well. It's fascinating. It's not a command. Verse 6, it's just that he's actually convinced that Gaius is patterned as a man of faithfulness. He will just continue to care for these brothers as this pattern continues to happen. More individuals sent out He knows you will do well to keep doing this. By contrast, well, let me look it up in terms of a manner. I just nearly passed over manner. Look at verse 6, bottom of verse 6. Talking about these individuals bearing witness to his love, he says this, you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Now, when we think about manner worthy of God, if we think about manner generally, Uh, If you guys think about a a surgeon, a cardiologist, okay, if you say, hey, how did you perform the surgery? If you say, tell me the means by which you performed the surgery, he's going to list all the tools. Scalpel, there was definitely a machine that was suctioning a lot of blood. There was a machine that was keeping the heart going. Lots of tools involved in that process. But if you asked him, tell me the manner in which you did the heart surgery, he would say, very carefully, uh, with extreme precision, It has to do with the way in which he did the surgery. And so Gaius caring about hospitality for people, of course there's going to be all of these things, food, water, supplies, a bed. Those are all going to be needed. But what is he most concerned with? The manner in which he's doing it. It's a manner that's actually worthy of God. So he's caring for these individuals. Think about it. Imagine you're one of these traveling brothers. You're a stranger. You're regularly traveling. You're most likely walking from town to town and you're visiting churches. And just by way of example on some of those distances, just think about this. You're walking day in, day out. From Ephesus to Smyrna, it's 43 miles walking. Smyrna to Pergamum, 70 miles. Pergamum to Thyatira, 50 miles. Thyatira to Sardis, 45 miles. Sardis to Philadelphia, 30 miles. Philadelphia to Laodicea, 55 miles. Now, I'm not very good at walking, but that's a lot of miles. And I would be pretty tired. Here's a a comment uh, given by Jeffers again on this. And he's just talking about traveling in this time period for an individual like this. He says, persons traveling long distances, such as the apostles, would carry a sack with food a change of clothes, and perhaps the tools of their trade. 
They would buy food in towns or in farmer's markets along the way. When the Apostle Paul stayed in a town for under a week, he probably spent more time in travel than in ministry. Always walking. The roads are dusty. The sun is hot. The roads are long. Something that can wane in our hearts on long travel is actually our thinking. Our bodies are tired. Our mind is impacted. Truth is harder to live out. And we have to fight our flesh to a greater degree. We have all these terms we've come up with for this, right? I'm not angry. I'm just hungry. I'm hangry. It's like, well, that's not even a word. Okay, but we've come up with it because we're angry, right? I'm just mad. I want what I want. And I'm having to navigate wrestling through my flesh in the midst of a difficult circumstance because I need something to eat. I remember walking with Zach Can and Matt Dodd going from the, the coastal beach of Bilial all the way into the village. And that's a 10-hour hike, and that's not that many miles. But we started talking about all the food that we missed in America. And then once that conversation was done, then we went on to all the songs that we remembered. So we were singing songs. Then it was favorite passages in scripture. And then it was just silence. And the silence was the remaining half of the time because you're, just, you're tired. You're weary. You're longing to go and lie down on a bed and just go to sleep. These travelers were tired. They were weary. Sure, they needed all of these things, but they needed an individual to actually care for them in a particular manner. Gaius did that. Even men that are strong in their convictions biblically, they live those things out right. They know their Bibles. Guess what? They have to be reminded about what is true. Hey, this is what's true. I'm so thankful I get to care for you. But remember the gospel. Remember why you're traveling. They had to be reminded. Another reason there's a commendation here is verse 7. It says, for the sake of the name, look down at that. John explains why Gaius' support for these men needed to be so well done. They weren't going out because of Caesar's name. They weren't going out because they were making a name for themselves. They went out for the sake of the name, Christ himself. Churches, no doubt, needed to be planted Young pastors needed to be well instructed. The lost needed to be reached, absolutely, but they were secondary items. You know, in Greek, it's interesting because you can put wording in front of a sentence and it puts greater emphasis on it. And so what John does here in Greek, it actually reads like this. For the sake of the name, they went out. That's how he wrote it. He puts all of his weight on the name. We switch it over in English because it sounds better to say, for the sake of the name, he went out. Christ's honor and mission and being witness to the nations is in view here. These are individuals who want to see Christ's name proclaimed. And so John says, that's why they're going out. How could we not support them? In the Roman world, roads were constructed in a way to support travelers moving from city to city. And the primary reason for that was supporting those under Roman delegation. If you had a letter that was sent from Caesar, you had to get it to the other place as quickly as you possibly could. And so every 10 miles, they had an outpost that was stationed to be able to give supplies and everything for people as they traveled. But they were also places that had everything that you would think that they would have there that is not good and very unsavory. And so these were not the places that these traveling missionaries went to. They were reliant upon the individuals that were their brothers in Christ to care for them along the way. John finishes up this section looking at verse 8, and he calls everybody. He includes himself into this. Look at this, verse 8. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. John puts himself right in the middle of this. He says, this is what we ought to be doing, Gaius. He puts himself in here. John includes himself because he views this as being so critical to the work of the gospel expanding out into Asia even further than it presently is. Even though Gaius isn't traveling with these brothers, he's not engaging in what they're doing. He is just as engaged in their work as they are because of what? His support plays this critical role. How could these men move forward in their work if Gaius and others had not been those who were carrying them along? This word here is literally to pick something up. 
And so you even have this word utilized with Jesus ascending on the cloud in his ascension. Here it's used in terms of you're picking an object up and you're carrying it where it needs to go. That's the picture. It's, hey, we're lightening the load of these individuals so they're able to put all of their energy and their focus to what they actually need to do. This text provides so much encouragement to me personally, knowing many of you have just been faithful partners in ministry for years in Papua New Guinea. It's a joy to know that each one of you have locked arms with us in that endeavor. I have never met an individual who has really thought critically about this. Um, I've met with somebody even recently who just said, hey, we've been able to support you and finish here for years, but I just feel like we've never been part of the ministry. I'm like Sir John tells us that you're a full-fledged partner in ministry. You always have been. This is how God views it. The joy of partnership in the gospel expansion is not always joyful. That moves us into our second section, which is a frightening opposition. From Gaius and the joy and the delight of everything that he was doing, the commendation that is there, we actually find that the focus that John has here on gospel expansion support actually has opposition. Look at this at verse 9. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Wow. It's a massive contrast to Gaius. You have a, a wicked leader here in opposition to supporting the sent out ones. The fact that no comment is given about the man makes me assume, at least, that Gaius knew exactly who he was. It'd be strange to call a person out by name, but Gaius has no idea who he is. There's no commentary given on him. It's just, hey, this individual is, is dangerous. Uh, the wording here, it says he's a, he's a first lover. He just enjoys being the guy that's first. He's the one that, I'm going to get out there, I'm going to lead everybody in this. And it's a self-directed, self-guided love. This man is also known, but he's known for all the wrong things. Uh, for John says in verse 9, he wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes does not accept what we say. It isn't that he didn't receive any of the letters. It actually is that he hated the things that were written in them. He hated the truth. He had a lack of desire to even obey the things that John was putting in front of him. Verse 10, you see this man's pattern actions. He is opposed to gospel expansion support. He is opposed to gospel expansion. He says he's speaking despairingly, negatively of John and his associates. He's not welcoming the traveling brothers. He forbids those who have a desire to welcome them. Even the desire, the want to do it, he's opposed to them. And he puts them out of the church. The word here, it put out, sounds so gentle. It's like, oh, thank you for coming. We're going to have you leave now. No, this is uh, ekbalo. It, it literally is like to throw, and it's like to throw away from. So it's to cast out. Same word you would think in terms of casting into hell. This is the door is open, and you kick them out the door. There's nothing that's gentle in here about this man. I don't think you could find a greater contrast in between Gaius and then comparing to Diotrephes. Remember what John said in the beginning, verses 3 through 4? He said, Gaius' pattern of life, walking in the truth, demonstrated that he loved the truth of the gospel. It, that was the picture. You could see it in his actions. Diotrephes is the exact opposite. It's not clear where Diotrephes was located in relation to Gaius, but we know that he is an individual that is known, and he is an individual who is a threat. John says in verse 10 here, he calls out this behavior and he says, if I come, verse 10, which means more, when I come, I will bring to remembrance his deeds, which he does. And then he lists everything that he does. How would you like to have your name forever written in scripture as the individual that was opposed to the apostle John and the endeavor of gospel expansion throughout 
the region of Asia. Forever written. Sobering. Because of the severity of Diotrephes' words against John, the rejection of these traveling missionaries, he moves into the next section. John moves to warn Gaius. He gives him an encouraging charge in verse 11 through 12. What do you think could have begun creeping into Gaius's thinking, into his heart? He sees Diotrephes. This man has prominence. He's even throwing people out of the church. And if he's in the same region or an area that's close by, what could start moving into Gaius's heart? A man who's only patterned by caring for traveling missionaries. He does it in a manner that's worthy of God. John is only encouraged, but as a faithful shepherd, he's concerned for Gaius. What is he going to be tempted to do? And so he brings him to this charge. Fear, suspicion, worries, anxiousness. What did the beloved Gaius need to hear from his spiritual father in the Lord, the old man? What did he need to tell him? His father in the Lord, he needed to actually tell him how to conduct himself in light of Diotrephes. This is actually the first of only two commands you find in the entire letter of 3 John. And he tells him what he needs to do. Don't and do. Beloved, do not imitate. Don't pattern. Don't mimic what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Man, it's just a quick charge. He wants Gaius to have clarity on how he needs to conduct himself. And it's interesting as you read this, I don't know if it's ringing in your ears, but that terminology just sounds like 1 John, doesn't it? Listen to this. This is 1 John 2, verses 10 through 11. But the one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness blinded his eyes. It's literally like John already wrote 1 John, maybe, and here he is quoting from what he already wrote. We know that pattern actions display the heart. John does not take the time to mince his words. He's clear, but he's kind. But he also is very quick to make sure that Gaius understands the great danger of even mimicking the behavior of Diotrephes, even if that comes with great cost for him. He then commends a very faithful servant to Gaius. Think about how encouraged Gaius would have been by this man, Demetrius. Most likely the one that hand-delivered the letter to Gaius from John, probably one of these men standing at Gaius' door while he's reading it. Look at his credentials. This is probably one of the most well-credentialed men that we have in Scripture. Demetrius has received a good witness from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our witness, and you know that our witness is true. So not only is he's testified by, well, by everyone. Okay, that's pretty broad. He's testified by the truth itself. Everything that he communicates is true. It's good. It's right. And he's testified by the apostle John as being a man who's faithful. And he says, and you know that our testimony is true. Just like Gaius, Demetrius is a man who is walking in the truth. It's his pattern of life. He's faithful in these things. Gaius should have no doubts about Demetrius' character. And think about how encouraging he would be as a partner in ministry. Here's Gaius. He has concerns over what's happening with Diotrephes. He has concerns over even the fear or temptation of maybe even being cast out of the church as a result of it. What was his influence going to look like? And here comes this man that is fully credentialed and he's able to talk with him in ministry. That would be an encouragement to him. Well, John's letter is really just not that long. And so we come to a, a loving partnership in 13 through 15. A single sheet of parchment has to come to an end, right? And so he tells his beloved child in the truth that he doesn't want to just keep writing to him, but rather to come and to be able to see him. I think the, the expression of pen and ink is kind of fun. 
Second John, he actually doesn't say pen and ink. He says paper and ink. And so it looks like his idiom is just interchangeable. And he's just picking which one he wants as he writes third John. But John plans to come and see Gaius face to face. Can you think about how sweet that would be for him? And my guess is his trip is going to be planned. He's going to not only talk with Gaius face to face, and that's going to be great, but he's probably going to go talk to somebody else face to face too. And that's going to be horrible. So the joy that Gaius is going to have will actually be a day of great difficulty for Diotrephes. And we have no idea if that man repented. He moves on to greetings in verse 15. It says, greet the friends. You know, and I spent a decent amount of time just thinking on this. Because every other place that you look in Scripture, it's, well, greet the brothers, you know, and the sisters greet you, and brothers and sister terminology. And then I'm like, but these are just friends. So, like, what do I do with friends? Like, are these people he knows? Like, like who are they? But then thinking long enough, he's been talking about the brothers, the brothers, the brothers. And so he's chosen a word, the brothers, as his technical word for the traveling teacher, preacher, missionaries. And so if he used that word here, it would be a little redundant, wouldn't it? And so he says, greet the friends. The friends here greet you. Probably looking at individuals who are just enamored with the ministry that they have in front of them. Wouldn't it be sweet to know that wherever John is and Gaius knows, there are friends that have locked arms in ministry there that want to make sure Gaius gets a greeting from them. And Gaius now gets his second command. You have better make sure you greet the friends there because everybody here wants to make sure you greet them. And so you just get to see friendship and ministry played out here with sweet clarity. And just like that, Gaius finishes his letter, he sets it down, and he welcomes these traveling brothers into his home. He gives sacrificially of himself because of his love for the truth of the gospel. It's that gospel that declares that believing in Jesus Christ alone is the only thing that forgives us of all of our sin. It makes us right before God. He didn't die for nothing. His death dealt with the penalty and the consequence for our sin, for my sin, for your sin. That's a message that we preach. That's the message that Gaius loved. That's the message that John loved. That's the gospel expansion that John was moving throughout Asia. And it's the gospel message that needed support, which is why this letter was written. That same message that these traveling brothers carried from town to town and eventually it was carried all the way to us, to each one of us, individually. Gaius had his part to play in that work. God chose to preserve his labors for all time to give us an example to walk in. Don't miss that. If you're wondering what 3 John is all about, it's about partnering in ministry so the gospel continues to expand. And specifically, making sure the individuals who are carrying that gospel message are well cared for and provided for. Literally right now in P&G, Zach Can, Brian Twombly, Brett Stewart, and Kambuk Tai are hopping on a helicopter and making their way into Maui Roro to work on the house. The final guy's trip in terms of construction. This isn't the, the stuff that's going to be the lady organizing, structuring the house. This is the man stuff. This is the, the tough stuff. They wouldn't be there if they weren't well supported. They wouldn't be able to get into the village if they weren't well supported in that work. And we are all ministry partners with them in that labor Some of us will never step foot in Papua New Guinea. We won't get our feet dirty on the soil in Papua New Guinea. We won't enjoy the massive humidity. But we're full-fledged partners in that work. And Sir John is that letter we need to go to for encouragement, to remember that we need to have our hand in that. And Grace Bible, you have done that so well. And my commendation of that is press on in doing that so well. Let's make sure that we are sending missionaries in a manner that is worthy of God. 
And with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I praise you for the beautiful feet of the individuals who brought the gospel message to the individuals that preached it to us. Lord, it is the gospel message that has been carried literally all over the world. It has truly gone from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Lord, that work will continue and continue and continue until the day that you return. And we long for that day to come. God, I pray that you would make us faithful individuals, getting involved and laboring in these efforts, just as Gaius labored in these wonderful efforts. God, that we would be those who are regularly thinking of ways to care for and send those who are taking the gospel, expanding it into places where it is not, and let us do that in a manner that is worthy of God. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.